Welcome to a code report solution video. In this video, we're going to be solving a problem in Python, Wiwa, BQN, and an unnamed stack language. So the problem that we're going to be solving is the Pythagorean theorem. And the reason that we are solving this is because earlier today, I was watching one of the most recent strange loop talks by an individual by the name of Douglas Krieger. And this talk is entitled, Can Cat Native Programming and Stack-Based Languages? And it is a decent talk, but I thought I was gonna love this talk, and I did not. And that is because there are a few things that really ruffled my feathers in this talk. And the one that we're going to address in this video is the following piece of code. He starts off by showing the implementation, or a potential implementation, of the Pythagorean theorem in Python. And as soon as I saw this code, I thought to myself, damn, he did Python so dirty. No experienced Python developer would write anything even remotely close to this. And I don't even think a beginner Python programmer would ever end up with something like this. One of the main things wrong with this is that it's not in a function, but he goes on to fix that a couple minutes into looking at this code. And so I thought, at least he's put it inside a function. But overall, it's still just, this is maybe some of the worst code that I've ever seen in a technical presentation that's talking about programming languages. I understand that this is for the purposes of pedagogical, you know, comparing languages. But whenever you're going to compare languages, you should do your best to write the most idiomatic version of that code in that language. And I think this is so far from that in Python. And so if we zoom in on this, let's refactor this a bit and see what I think would be the idiomatic Python solution. So we're now in a version of this code that I can play around with. And the first thing, the first thing, I mean, there's many things wrong with this code, but the first thing is, who has heard of the famous formula? Leg one squared plus leg two squared equals hypot squared or hypotenuse squared. Nobody, nobody's heard of that. Do you know why? Because that's not the formula. The formula is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So what are we doing with all these leg one, leg two, L1, L2 squared variables? Let's get rid of those folks and replace this with a and b. I don't think folks are gonna be confused of what a and b are in a, in a function called Pythagoras or a function called hypotenuse. So first change, let's yeet leg one and leg two, and already it's starting to look better. Still, it's egregious, but it's starting to look better, folks. Next thing, what, what are we doing with all these locals? You know, maybe we needed that because our variable names were four characters long, but now we're dealing with a single character. Let's just put this in line. And I know there's a few watchers of this video that are gonna go, I don't know the precedence order, so maybe I should throw some parentheses in, in there. If you'd like to do that, go right ahead, folks. I prefer it without, but if you wanna do this, I'm not complaining. It looks the same to me. Next thing, let's get rid of the other local. You know, it's unnecessary, all these locals. The computation is pretty concise. And maybe, like I said before, if we had leg one times leg one plus leg two times leg two, you wanna break that up. But don't call them leg one and leg two, problem solved. And the next thing that I would wanna do is add some type annotations because that's kind of modern Python. You don't need to do this. And this is my preferred version of the code because it gets rid of the parentheses. And the last thing that we can do is change the name of this function. Because Pythagoras is the name of a dude that created this formula. It's not the name of the formula. Technically, it's a theorem called Pythagorean theorem. But I went and asked ChatGPT, what do libraries typically call this? And the answer is, they call it hypot, short for hypotenuse. So we come back to our code, rename this hypot. And at this point, you might be thinking, why not just call the built-in? And for the purposes of Doug's talk, I understand that we need to see the implementation of this in order to compare it to our stack language. And so that's completely fine if he had shown this. But this is why Python is so amazing. It's because half the time you don't need to write the code because there's a library out there that does it. And we already are importing that library. Hypot exists in math, if you remember from the response from ChatGPT. And so we can actually just make a call to math.hypot. Not important for his talk, but I do think it's worth mentioning because folks might not know that, you know, when you're in Python, try just looking for code that someone else has written in a library 
a standard library, a built-in. That's why Python's so amazing. You can get so much done because you don't really have to write the code. Someone else probably did it for you. Anyways, this is the Python done right, in my opinion. And he goes on to show a stack language, which he does not name. So I don't actually think this is an actual language. I asked ChatGPT, and ChatGPT said this was closest to fourth. However, when I tried to implement it in fourth, I got pretty far, but you can see that the results of evaluating this is 25 and 169. Why is that? And that's because square root is not a built-in. So if you delete the square root and go run this in fourth, uh, I could get it working. And I know that there's a bunch of different fourths out there. So potentially it's a built-in in one of the fourths and the fourth that I was working with just didn't have it. But uh, we'll call this fourth. He did not use any functions. He did it all in line, which I guess highlights the fact that you can keep putting stuff on the stack and applying stuff. However, I think if you're trying to write a function like this, just give it a name and then call it twice. A little bit simpler than putting things in brackets and applying it. And this brings me to the part of the code where we're going to start looking at two different languages. So we've seen Python. We've seen an unnamed stack or concatenative language that is most similar to fourth, according to an LLM out there. And now we're going to look at solving this problem in Wiwa and BQN, two of my favorite languages. And I think the Wiwa code, which is both a stack and an array language, is much, much nicer than this unnamed stack language. Because you see here, we've got two multiplications and we've got two dupes plus a swap. And we're having to manipulate a bunch of stuff, but Wiwa comes with a bunch of combinators that are much more powerful than what uh, Doug is showing in this solution. So let's hop over to WeWaPad and take a look at how to solve it a couple different ways there. So here we are in WeWaPad, and the first thing you might notice if you watched my last three videos on WeWa is that we have a new font, WeWa 386, absolutely love it. That was probably one of the least appealing things about WeWa before, is I wasn't a big fan of the Deja Vu font. Now they've got WeWa 386 based on APL 386, absolutely love it. Let's get to the solution of the problem though. And note that WeWa is very quickly evolving and it is unstable. So this glyph here was initially called NoOp, but now it's called identity, which I love because that's the actual name of the function. Identity just returns you what you give it. And let's build this up. So the first thing that we're gonna do for the first two solutions is we are gonna join our two values and put them in an array, which is gonna make applying operations to this array pretty easy because we have rank polymorphism now. So the first thing we wanna do is square, which we can do by power two. Then we want to do a plus reduction, and then we just want to do square root. Love the input method, super fast. This is pretty beautiful. All right, we're gonna change this solution slightly, and that's just by showing what we've shown before is that you can do squaring without the power function by making use of multiplication and duplicate. So if we do this, this basically duplicates the top value on our stack and then multiplies them together, which is just another way to square. All right, we've moved through our first two solutions. Now we are going to do a brand new solution and it is going to involve not putting these into an array. So if we start with this once again, the first thing we want to do is square the top value on our stack, which is gonna give us nine. But what we want to do here is we wanna apply this partially applied power of two to both of the values at the top of our stack. Luckily, we've got a combinator, if I can type correctly, called both, which if we now put this in parentheses, it will apply this a partially applied to the power of two to both our values. So now we have nine and 16. Absolutely fantastic. Now we don't need to do a plus reduction. We can just call the binary plus on the top two values of our stack. And once we do that, once again, we can call the square root function. And our final solution is just once again, replacing our power two with the square duplicate and we are done. And if we come over here and drag this down so we can see our test cases again, delete this, we will see that we get the correct answers for both of our test cases. So here are the four WeWa solutions. Let's now hop over to BQMPad and do the exact same thing and note the differences. So here we have the identity function. Technically it's the K combinator because it's discarding one of the arguments. Details though, they don't matter. So we're gonna do the, first, the same thing that we did in WeWa for the first couple. And that is by uh, concatenating these into an array first. So once we have this, we can do two power, however, that's actually not power, that's multiplication. This is in the wrong order because we have the two on the left. So we need to apply the 
uh, C combinator to flip this. And this is what this is called. I think it's actually called swap in BQN, similar to what it's called in WeWa. So now we have our two squared values. We can now sum these up. And now we just need to square root, which we do by doing an underscore. Note that this no longer parses correctly because of trains. This is trying to parse this as a three train at the top level here, unary, binary, unary. But in order to put that back into a two train, we just call nothing here and we're good to go. And I guess we should add the second use case um, so that we can make sure and we will go show for that and make this line up so that my OCD is happy. All right, we've got our first solution. Now let's show how we can do the second solution similar to WeWa. We need to comment this out though, otherwise we're gonna get a name conflict. And in order to use the multiplication here, we're gonna to need to use another nothing because this forms a three train previously, but now that we have a unary function, it's gonna try and form a three train with the plus. So we need two nothings. That's our second solution. Now, moving on to our third solution. And once again, we're gonna go back to the beginning. And in this one, we want to do the equivalent of what both was in WeWa. And that is the over combinator, AKA, it's called over in APL and BQN, but it corresponds to the psi combinator in combinatorial logic. So what this does is if it, it takes a unary operation, or a binary operation on the left, and a unary operation on the right, it will just basically apply the unary operation to both of your arguments and then the binary operation afterwards. So if we, uh, if we take the tack, this is basically just going to apply identity to both of our arguments, so it just returns you the value and then concatenates them. But what do we want to do here? We want to square. So the first way we can do this is we can partially apply, if I can type fast enough, to the power operator. So that squares things. And the binary operation that we want to apply after this is plus, similar to what we did in BQN. And now at this point, we actually have a unary function here. So we don't need to worry about using nothing in order to avoid a three train. This is just going to be a two train. And pretty beautiful, pretty beautiful folks. And this brings us to our final and fourth solution, which of course is just going to be the trick of using multiplication with the W combinator. And this is actually my favorite solution of the four. Note that you might be thinking, why do I need parentheses here? And that's because uh, combinators bind from the left. So if we delete this, what we're gonna end up with is the square root of two. And why is that? Now what's happening is this is binding first and the monadic definition of multiply is sine. So it's turning all of our values into ones. And then we end up with one plus one, which is two. And then we square it. And you might be thinking, well, what is this doing? This is just commuting or swapping the, uh, that the order of the arguments. So previously we were calling, you know, three, four. And then when you call that it's four, three, but because the side combinator applies the unary operation to both arguments, commuting this does absolutely nothing. Uh, so if we get rid of this, it spells the exact same thing in this case. But this is the solution that we're working towards. And pretty fantastic, folks. Weewa, BQN, absolutely beautiful. And hopefully you have learned something from this video. Note that, maybe I'll add an extra slide here. Boom. Here we are back with all of our solutions from Python, BQN, and WeWa. And the thing that I wanted to finish with is highlighting once again the combinators in each of WeWa and BQN. So I mentioned that we have both in WeWa and over in BQN and other APLs, and that corresponds to the psi combinator from combinatory logic. Here we are applying a unary function, which is square, and applying that to two different arguments and then applying a binary operation afterwards. This actually gets formed by the over combinator in BQN. Note that it's just juxtaposition in WeWa. We're applying both to square, and then after that, we've got two values on our stack and we're just adding them. We've also got the W combinator in the form of duplicate in WeWa and self in BQN. And we also have on the screen the C combinator, which shares the same glyph as self, AKA the W combinator. But in this case, it's applied dyadically, in which case you are commuting the order that you pass your arguments to this binary function. If you would like to know more about combinatory logic and you haven't already, go to combinatorylogic.com to check out the table, the links. On the front page is a link to my composition intuition talk, subtitled Combinators and Tacit Programming. It covers a lots of history and a lot of combinators. It's a great starting point. And if you're also interested in other videos, there are a list on my links page that stars what I think are the best 
talks to watch, starting with Point Free or Die, all the way back from 2016. That's how I started my deep dive into the world of combinatory logic, followed up with A Flock of Functions Part 1 and Part 2, then with the very recent, it was in June of 2023, just this year, at Zurich Hack, I think it's how it's pronounced, in Switzerland, Ben Lin. He's never given a recorded talk before. This was the first time. It's a fantastic talk. The visualization that he shows of how combinators evaluate, it's fantastic. The second half of the talk is focused on building a Haskell compiler, potentially less relevant if you're le looking to learn about combinators, but still very, very interesting. And then my talk, as mentioned before. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and we will see you in the next video.